We're going to transport you to the Canadian North today to teach you a little bit about the Inuit culture up north and some of the sites and animals and wildlife um, on board the expeditions with Adventure Canada. So if you haven't been on a Zoom call yet, we're going to do a little housekeeping. Um, everyone right now has been placed on mute. If you do have any questions at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little chat function and some people are already chatting with us, which is great. Um, Entry, put in your questions there. And then we have Annabelle is gonna be managing the chat. And at the end, we're gonna compile everything and answer your questions um, as we go through. The volume is kind of set by Zoom. So if you can't quite hear us, um, you might wanna just use the volume setting on your computer to turn us up but we will try and talk as loud and clear as we can. So there we go. So who are we? Who is Merit Travel? Um, some of you may have uh, booked with us in the past and thank you. For those who don't know us, um, we're, can we're Canada's leader in specialty travel. We have over 25 years of experience um, in the industry. And what we like to say is we're experience makers. Um, we like to curate special and unique experiences that you may not have seen anywhere else. And Adventure Canada is definitely a prime example of uh, some of the unique experiences that we can offer at Merit Travel. We always say, if you can dream it, we can make it happen. So, you know, today you'll learn a little bit more about that. And who am I? Uh, who is this person talking on the screen with you today? Um, my name is Darren. I'm located in Ottawa, um, but I am one of the regional managers for Merit Travel and I'm one of our adventure travel specialists. So I work very closely with, um, with Adventure Canada and my team does as well too. So this is a little bit who, uh, who I am and that photo there, of course, is um, from me when I sailed with Adventure Canada back in 2017. Again, a little bit about our advantage. I already said it before, you know, we do personalized experience. We, we live the lifestyle you saw in the last photo, that was me in the Arctic. And that's how, that's what we like to do. When you come into our office or not come into our office, I guess, uh, when you talk to one of our consultants, um, more than likely either that person you talk to or someone in our organization has been there. So we like to give you firsthand experience on um, the best way to travel, the best way to learn about the countries that you're going into and make it the best experience for you. Travel insurance, well, we had to throw this slide in there. I'm sure anybody that possibly had something booked in 2020 um, is very familiar with travel insurance and the advantages of making sure that you have travel insurance because you don't wanna leave home without it, whether it's medical, um, expenses that you might incur, you never know, um, or cancellations due to a global pandemic. This is what your insurance is there for. And it's so, so important um, to protect your investment. Um, just like anything else, to protect your home, your car, you want to protect your, your travel to make sure that uh, if anything were to go awry, that uh, your investment is protected. And last thing I want to talk quick about when about our about us before we go into the exciting part about uh, why we're here today to learn about the Arctic is we do have a new partnership with a program called Uplift. If you have bought anything online since the pandemic, and I'm sure everyone has increased their online shopping, you might see a little box in the bottom that says pay monthly and uh, monthly installments. And that's what we have partnered with as well, too. So you know, you can book onto an Adventure Canada expedition for next year and then slowly pay it off um, with no prepayments, no, no interest, et cetera. So our advisors will be able to inform you a bit about that. Now let's talk about the Arctic. This is not what you're gonna experience on your expedition because this was actually taken in Iqaluit um, a couple of years ago. And they, I believe the term is Arctic sunbathing. And I wanted to start out the presentation with a little bit of a little bit of a story as to how I kind of became in love with the Arctic. And previous to experience in the Arctic, I traveled all over the world. Um, I lived in various countries. I've lived in Peru and Honduras. And my favorite thing about travel is the culture. And I bounced all over the place until 2015. I met a girl, and that's you know that's 
usually the start of a good story. And I was having dinner with her and there's this music on and I was like, what is this? And she's like, this is throat singing from, from the North. And I was like, tell me more. And she said, I used to live in the Arctic. And from that point on, she taught me all about the Arctic and it's how amazing it is. And I just wanted to learn more. And I went on the expedition in 2017 to see it firsthand. And now I'm married to this person that uh, introduced me to, to the Arctic and made me fall in love with the Arctic. So that's why it's special to me. And you'll see in the slides today and when you're talking to our guests from Adventure Canada, why they love the Arctic and why it's special to them, you'll see why you'll want to, to join an expedition like this. So real quick, um, the guys at Adventure Canada are, are, are going to talk about um, about how did the experience and one of my favorite things. So I'm going to go through a couple of my favorite things on Adventure Canada before we jump over is the itinerary. It's an expedition. So the biggest difference is, is when you look on the left, this is probably your typical cruise itinerary that you're going to go on in February to go through the Caribbean and each red dot is where you're going to go. Monday, you're going to go to Cosimo, Tuesday, Costa Maya, and so on. When you look on the right, you'll see a satellite view of some red lines and some green squiggly lines. The red line is where we we're supposed to go. The green line is where we ended up. So the, my favorite thing about expedition travel is that little bit of unknown, is that every day we woke up on the ship, looked out the window, and oh, it's foggy where are we going to end up because we can't dock today we can't stop at this port so jason well the jason and the expedition leaders will pull out their maps and figure out something amazing and interesting so it can sometimes change on a whim so when you're on these trips keep an open mind and you get to see some sites that you may have never seen before and it gets super exciting to to learn about something new or step on land that no one has ever stepped on before. And this is an example. So we had, we got, I believe it was fog um, one morning and we couldn't do the regular landing. So they pulled us up here. This was untouched, never walked on by humans before, I, we believe. And we got to do, we got to do a hike around there. So it was absolutely incredible. I'll just flip through a couple of slides on some of my photos because I love sharing my photos. Uh, these are some of the icebergs that uh, we saw in our expedition. So Mark, you can just flip through those real quick. These are real photos from my camera. You can see how close the Zodiacs are getting to the ice. Um, it's absolutely incredible. And we're here today to talk about, you know, wildlife and culture. So these are just a few pictures of, um, of my trip of a polar bear sighting that we saw in Inuit Games. And uh, on the top left, it, that was a very, very special experience. When we sailed, we sailed on our trip from Greenland over to the Canadian North. And when we were crossing through and entering Canadian waters, they did a traditional uh, welcoming ceremony. Um, with some of the local culturalists on board. Again, Jason and, and Martin will talk about that. And top right, we were in the Zodiac one day and on the radio, they said, look behind you. And that's what was probably about maybe 10 feet from our Zodiac. So definite mm -hmm. um, animal sightings as well too, which, is, which makes the experience super special. And anybody that we have a, I'm going to introduce our first special guest on the call today. Um, if you have one of the Adventure Canada brochures or if you've been on their social media over the past little while, you'll see this photo. And the gentleman that's laughing on the left and the lady that's with him, I search far and wide. I'm like, these people look like they're having a fantastic experience with Adventure Canada. And how do we get hold of them? Well, fortunately enough, they're actually my in laws. And uh, they sailed with uh, Adventure Canada a few couple of years ago and uh, they're hoping to go back again and like I said before we love sharing first-hand experiences not only by ourselves as uh, as travel advisors but of our clients as well too so I've invited Steve and Susan to kind of tell us a little bit about their experience and why it is special for them so 
I'm going to Steve or Susan, if you're able to unmute or I can mute you, unmute you. Try again. Yes, we're unmuted and uh, whoop. Okay. We are unmuted. Perfect. We can't see you, but that's okay. All right. The host is in oh, control of our video. video. Yep. <laughs> there we are. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Stand by. Yep. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve, and um, a pleasure indeed to uh, come back and uh, and be able to share some of uh, our personal viewpoints on uh, our. Adventure Canada experience. We were on the High Arctic Explorer in August of 2019. And uh, I want to be very brief, but I want to be very, uh, I feel some pretty intense emotions after the fact. It was a, a life changing uh, opportunity for us in, on so many levels. And uh, I just want to focus on three areas, if I might. Uh, first one would be the, the camaraderie and common spirit we felt on the expedition. Uh, uh, a tremendously hospitable crew and staff on, on board Ocean Endeavour, but then again, uh, over 30 specialists who uh, were, were there to make our experience uh, all the best, and uh, it certainly was in a sense, and I think I came away with this, with the fact that there were approximately slightly over 200 uh, between passengers and, and uh, Adventure Canada staff, and we all had a common a viewpoint, a common philosophy, a common outlook, and a common desire to make the best of this lifetime adventure. And I, I truly, I truly felt that um, in terms of the openness of the staff to ensure that we were clearly sort of educated and 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 made more knowledgeable about about our experience. I want to talk also about the the cultural exposure. Um, um, it was tremendous, uh, and I considered an honor and a privilege to be given uh, insight as I don't think you can, you can have a similar uh, view on uh, the reality of the Northern Indigenous peoples without uh, having the kind of experience that we had in the sense of getting insight into their history, into their culture, into their con the contemporary challenges of, of where they live and, and how they're coping with that. And also how, how, how honored we were to be given insight into uh, their cultural traditions and, and also uh, being given some insight into the resilience and, uh, and, and, and their capability of blending both their culture and the challenges of contemporary time. So it was really, really an eye opener, really uh, much appreciated and, and something that has given us uh, uh, you know, uh, good thoughts going forward in terms of uh, how they will carry themselves forward. But it was tremendous to meet the cultural interpreters and to be given that privilege. The other aspect, and I, I talked to many of our, pass our, our passengers on board the expedition, we were trying to find the words to say how the landscape and uh, the environment touched us. And the closest thing I could I could put a label on it, if you will, is like a personal communion with the environment and the landscape. As Darren mentioned, walk, walking on terrain that maybe, just maybe, you're the first person to have walked there, or looking at the uh, remnants of Thule culture that was shared with us by expedition representatives. Just, just an amazing feeling, and to and I came home thinking that Canada is as high as it is wide. And it just made me feel, it kind of gave me a, a rubber stamp of my Canadian citizenship to, to know that I had seen that environment, been there, and obviously have the t-shirt. So anyway, but, but no, it was a truly life, truly life inspiring. And uh, the attention to detail of the staff, the ho hospitality of the ship and crew, and uh, the planning and the preparation was, it was as much educational as it was an adventure and, and truly um, the, small, the small number of passengers made it even more so as we, and we came and we're laughing with my friend Danny, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the specialists who was sharing it. And uh, 
and uh, the, the lady, the ladies to my left, uh, Ingrid and uh, Doris, were 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 table mates uh, over the laid over the cruise, and we just had a tremendous time. So, friendship, education, insight into the indigenous culture, and awe-inspiring landscape. So there we go. That's amazing. <laughs> So I prepared my notes independent of Darren, so I apologize if there's some repeat here, or I'm independent, I should say, of Steve, sorry. And, but I, be, I wanted to begin by saying that I was afraid to go on the Arctic ex expedition because I was always worried that I wasn't physically fit enough uh, to actually transfer in out of the zodiacs and to actually explore the land. But I can reassure people that I quickly learned that that wasn't a concern at all. And I found that all the passengers were there for the common purpose of learning, experience, and seeing this really unique area. The one thing ahead was that we were asked by, uh, prior to the journey by a Venture Canada team to do some readings. And they taught me the importance of the Arctic in relation to the rest of the world. And each time we landed, I too, like Steve, felt very privileged to walk on land that few Canadians had walked on before. The other thing I wanted to share with you is to, that to see the vastness of the Arctic, the beauty, but the harshness of it, um, and through the programming both on board the ship and arranged uh, in the inhabited communities, I developed a real admiration for the Inuit elders, for their skills to survive, their respect for nature and their spiritual beliefs. Um, the Adventure Canada team members, many of whom are highly acclaimed in their respective fields, were all warm, friendly, um, patient, and encouraging to allow me to uh, learn about the land, the history, and the nature that we were touching and uh, walking on. And whether we were on board ship or whether we we're on the land, I, I can say I always felt very safe. And finally, Jason, I uh, know you're on the call today and I want to thank you for the opportunity to meet Martha. And uh, Martha is an Inuit elder who was displaced to Greece Fjord with her family when she was just a little girl. And her family history that we learned by speaking to her will stay with me forever. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing your, your experience with us and uh, hopefully we'll have many others um, I'll be able to share a similar experience. So we're going to move to um, our special guests. We have Martin Aldrich, um, one of the expedition guides from Adventure Canada, and Jason, um, who's my expedition leader. Um, they're going to, to tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the itineraries you can experience with Adventure Canada. So guys. All right. Thank you very much, Darren. And thank you uh, for sharing. It's good to see you too again. It's, uh, Feels like a long time since we've not been up to the Arctic now for for a few years. Uh, but uh, for those of you joining, my name is Jason Edmonds. I am an expedition leader with Adventure Canada in the field, but I also work uh, in our main office here as our operations lead, and I'm responsible for kind of uh, uh, safe operation logistics, uh, community planning, as well as curating our onboard expedition team. Uh, which we'll talk about in uh, later on in the program. But uh, I'm also uh, Inuk. I'm from Nunatsiavut, which is in uh, the Inuit region within Northern Labrador, uh, one of the four Inuit regions in Canada. And today um, I'm going to be talking to you. I I'm going to give you a little bit of taste of what you'd see on board in terms of language. And I know that uh, some of you have been looking at the itineraries see some of the names in Inuktitut and are a little bit intimidated by them. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll run you through some of the names as they come up. Um, I'll tell you what they mean. I'll pronounce them properly so that you can give it a shot and, uh, and we'll go from there. And right now I'll pass it over to your uh, Martin who'll tell you more about the programs. Excellent. Thanks, Jason. And hi, everybody. I'm Martin. I uh, work on board the uh, Ocean Endeavour, the Adventure Canada Expedition Vessel as an expedition guide. And I also work in the office, although I am now located in my own office out in Vancouver, in North Vancouver. 
I work in the business development department. And so normally I'd be out on the road and doing these presentations uh, in person. So thanks for joining us virtually today. Uh, we're going to be talking uh, about a couple of different expeditions um, and generally about expedition travel. But we're going to focus in on our Heart of the Arctic program as well as High Arctic Explorer. Uh, Jason, uh, as he mentioned, will be uh, joining throughout to tell you how to properly pronounce the different place names. And uh, But just to, to back up a little bit, we're going to talk about Adventure Canada and the history of the company. And we'll come back to this map in just a little bit. So it started in 1987. Uh, Matthew Swan, his brother Bill Swan, and their friend Dave Fries uh, really wanted to get Canadians out into their backyard and out into the places that we rarely visit. Uh, they wanted to get up to Baffin Island and to Labrador. Um, by going overland initially, they realized the constraints of traveling overland and started chartering vessels in the early 90s. Uh, here we are now, 34 years later, on a larger vessel. Uh, but really, it started from that spirit of getting out and onto the land uh, to show people the rarely visited parts of Canada to do fun things like playing go golf at the North Pole. So this is one of the early expeditions that uh, Adventure Canada offered. And that kind of goofy nature and, and having fun really spills over into all of the Adventure Canada expeditions. Uh, here you can see Matthew Swan presenting one of the community members with this trophy. Um, we often play sports in communities when we are visiting. And um, of course, we, we like to have a lot of fun. And, and it's a great way to connect with the community members and to, uh, you know, have some laughs and, and, and experience just a little bit of lightheartedness. And that legacy of Adventure Canada is now continued by Cedar, Alana, and Matthew James, the Swan family, uh, family business. And uh, you can see a few of the different awards that the company has won over the years. And just uh, recently, for the fourth year running, we were voted uh, number one best adventure cruise line. Uh, so uh, talking about Adventure Cruise, this is the Ocean Endeavor. This is our expedition cruise vessel. And you can see one of the zodiacs that we use there in the bottom left. Uh, so this is an ice class vessel. Uh, we have 20 zodiacs on board. Uh, there are lots of modern amenities, including Wi-Fi, and we have computers on board, plenty of lounge space and uh, deck space to hang out on. And we have three different types of excursions that we have all included in the cost of the expedition. Uh, so Zodiac cruises, where we go from uh, the ship onto the Zodiac, and then we're on the Zodiacs for du the duration of the excursion. We're ice cruising. We're looking for wildlife, like Darren mentioned, uh, you know, maybe perhaps with some uh, bowhead whales, uh, depending on the type of wildlife that we see. It's a great way to get even closer uh, to these wonders of the natural world. And then we do like to get out onto the land as much as possible. So uh, we use the Zodiacs to go from the ship to the shore. And then we will uh, get out onto the land and go for a variety of different hikes. Uh, we go to different areas for uh, depending on your interests. So uh, all of the different hike options and outing options will be laid out in a briefing on board the ship prior to getting onto the land. Uh, lots of different options, whether you want to hang out with the ornithologist or the archeologist, or maybe you wanna go for a hike more based on um, getting a little bit more of the, the heart rate up. All options are available. And those are again, laid out on the ship prior to landing. And then a really special part of the Adventure Canada operation is getting into the communities, uh, these remote communities in Greenland and the Canadian Arctic. Um, they are, we do hire locally on the ship. But we also hire locally in the communities that we visit. So uh, you'll actually be toured around uh, the community by someone who lives in this place. Um, you may end up in their house having tea. Um, you are able to you know, buy arts and crafts directly from the artists that live here, uh, the locals that live here, and of course, trying, uh, trying some of the, the local food as well. Speaking of food, we do have three meals a day included as well on the, on the ship. Um, so there are um, multiple different options for each of the meals and uh, there are, uh, we can cater to any dietary need. Um, so lots of different options there in terms of vegetarian and, and um, any uh, dietary restrictions that you may have. And you can see a, a couple of the cabins pictured on the bottom there. Uh, we have 10 different cabin categories. Uh, certainly uh, inquire with your Merit Travel Advisor to find out more about what cabin category might be suitable for yourself. Um, you know, but you, to be honest, you don't spend too much time in your cabin. We have a lot of activities uh, on the ship as well as, of course, on the land as well. Um, you may want to be spending as much time as you possibly can out on the deck 
looking for wildlife, taking in the incredible vistas, um, perhaps in our lounge reading some of the books that we have on board that relate to the areas that we're traveling to. You can, as Darren did, partake in the polar dip. You can then hang out in the hot tub afterwards. And if that's maybe not your thing, you can join one of the yoga or stretch classes. There are a couple of saunas on board. There's um, a gym uh, and a heated pool as well. And I'll hand it over to Jason to talk about our staff. Thank you, Martin. And um, you know what? Getting to these locations is one thing. Uh, the ship is beautiful on its own, but that's not the reason why people are traveling with us. People are traveling with us to, to gain a deeper understanding of people and of place. And the way that we do that is through education and engagement. Uh, and our expedition team is really where this comes into hand. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we have a team of about 30 uh, expedition team members who are whose purpose is to bring to life the places that we're visiting. Um, and people learn in different ways. Everybody has different interests, different passions, and we try to accommodate that with our expedition team. So on any given expedition, you'll see uh, marine biologists, ornithologists, archeologists, botanists, um, the geologists, I'm sure there's another bunch of ologists uh, in there. And they're there not to just give keynote presentations, they're there to help guide you through the entire experience. So you'll see them all throughout broken into small groups educating people on the land uh, through interpretation and on-site location um, education, which is, which is really the, the huge benefit of having these people. Here's uh, Chris Wolf, he's an archaeologist, um, teaching people about what they're seeing on the land, which otherwise they would probably pass over and not even see. Um, but our landings are not always... Um, you can't just stand, you could just stand there and listen to Chris talk for hours and hours and hours, but you won't get enough information. But here he is again on board, giving a keynote presentation on the locations we just saw or that we're visiting. And, and this is really the power of traveling by this vessel. Um, the vessel is to get us from point A to point B in relative comfort, but it also provides us an amazing platform to give those presentations. And sciences are, are very important. It's, it's often the people why people are traveling, but we, because people are learning in different ways and we wanna give a fulsome view of the place we're traveling to, we have to include the arts. Uh, so um, crafters, uh, visual artists, musicians, photographers uh, are all coming on board as well to help you connect in different ways to the landscape, to the people that you're uh, visiting there. And of course, wherever we're going, we're traveling with people from the region. Um, and this has been a kind of keystone in how we operate. So in the Arctic regions, of course, we're going to be traveling with Inuit. Um, and we try to travel with as large a team as possible of Inuit uh, to give different perspective, different age groups will have, again, the, the amount of change that has happened in a relatively very short time um, is rapid. So we try to kind of gather different, uh, kind of different subsections and uh, share different perspectives of culture. And, and we try to go beyond kind of a surface level, um, we, we call a cultural iceberg. So like you will see drum dancing, you will see throat singing, but we also try to go into some deeper complex um, discussions uh, like reconciliation, like meaning of culture in a modern day um, and how it's represented. And we do that with our team of uh, cultural educators on board. Um, and we're really trying to make a focus on 
on getting getting more cultural educators and Inuit involved in the industry. Um, I became a part of Adventure Canada through a Inuit guide training program. Um, I, I started as a bear monitor, uh, which is kind of where my comfort level was, um, and and really started training and building into a leadership position. And we're trying to now uh, create this change in the industry. Uh, we've partnered with the uh, with the uh, government of Nunavut to create what we call the Nalunaksi training program. And this this program is uh, it, it, it loosely translates to informers. Um, and the goal is to have an Inuit run uh, training program for Inuit to become trained and comfortable to operate in a in a marine tourism environment. And uh, we ran a, uh, a pilot program a few years ago, which has been highly successful. I think we had 90% of the participants are now working within the industry. And we have a three year commitment from the government in Nunavut to continue this training uh, as we go forward. So we're, we're really excited about that. And you'll probably see some of these trainees on our two uh, featured voyages here, which are the Heart of the Arctic and the High, Explore, High Arctic Explorer programs. Um, they're quite different from each other. Uh, and you'll see that they really focus on uh, kind of the north and south of Baffin Island. Heart of the Arctic gets its name because um, you get a lot of communities right around that uh, Hudson Strait uh, area, and then a bunch of communities in Nunavik. And, and the reason is the, the wildlife there was so successful for hunting. And that's why you see a large population of Inuit gathering in that region. Um, and the, the wildlife is, is quite different than what you'd see in the high Arctic programs. Uh, and this is where you're really focusing on the uh, on Pilot Island, Dalagotup, Imunga, Devon Island, and uh, it, it, it's hard, it's difficult to compare one to the other. But Martin's going to give you his best shot at it in a minute. Wonderful, thank you, Jason. Yeah, so we will run through the two different itineraries that Jason just talked about. They are quite different, um, but you'll see somewhat of the day by day. Um, of, of what the trip will entail and some of the highlights. Of course, it's impossible to cover it all. Um, you really do have to come on board to experience an Adventure Canada expedition. And then just as Darren talked about, uh, you, you really, you know, there are dots on this map and those are I intended uh, itinerary and it will change. Uh, you can almost guarantee that we will have something that'll be a little different. And you know what, sometimes plan C or plan D can actually be the best plan and something that's totally unexpected and very unique. So uh, let's dive into the heart of the Arctic. Uh, this trip will actually start in Ottawa and we will fly up to uh, Baffin Island and start in Iqaluit. And we will then head into Hudson Strait, uh, visiting a few communities before going into Ungava Bay. We cross over the Davis Strait and we have a few different stops in Greenland before finishing in Kangarooswak and flying back to Toronto. So as mentioned, we start in Ottawa. We have a, a night prior to the trip in Ottawa here uh, to set the stage to have a, a meeting and a meet and greet before an early morning flight the next morning. And so this will go from Ottawa to Iqaluit. And I'm going to uh, jump in here. As I mentioned, I'm going to do a little bit of place name analysis as we're going through. So anytime you see an Inuktitut place name, I'll, uh, I'll just jump in. And Inuktitut place names are, are, they're way more interesting than the English place names. You'll notice English place names are always named after somebody who funded um, expeditions, whereas Inuit place names really try to describe the place. So in some cases, you'll actually see that the, the place name itself will describe uh, why that is a highlight that we visit. Uh, in this case, Iqaluit, and, and people butcher the name all the time, so don't feel bad if you can't quite uh, pronounce it. 
but the Q is a is quite a guttural sound, a <laughs> sound. Uh, so ichaluk means fish. Ichaluit means there's lots of fish. Thanks, Jason. So from Ichaluit, I hope I said that all right. Uh, we're heading out of Frobisher Bay. Um, this is really going to be that uh, first experience seeing sea ice on the expedition. Um, uh, we won't spend too much time in, in the community in the, in the capital of Nunavut, which is Iqaluit. Um, we will be, uh, there will be a long day as it is going from Ottawa on a flight, transferring from the uh, airport to the ship uh, and then doing a safety briefing, then heading out into Frobisher Bay. Um, so, uh, but that's really where the excitement begins as we head out into the sea ice uh, and head towards the lower Savage Islands. Um, couple photos, the, the photo on the left here is from my uh, experience on board in 2017 on Heart of the Arctic. We had a mum, a mother and a, a two and a half year old cub out on the sea ice in the lower Savage Islands. Uh, whenever we have sea ice, we always have a good opportunity to see wildlife like the walrus there pictured on the right. From the lower Savage Islands, we're gonna head around the southern tip of Baffin Island and into uh, Hudson Strait, and we will have a community visit in Kimarut. Yeah, so Kimarut, uh, the R is like a G-R guttural sound. Uh, we'll teach you when you guys get on board. But Khimrut means um, means heel, like on your foot, a heel. Khimrut means it's like a heel, which uh, it gets its name from the shape of the, uh, the kind of peninsula sticking into the water. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, it's a really spectacular entranceway into uh, the fjord here as we come into the community. Uh, its uh, population is about 400 or just under. Uh, it is a, a fantastic place to walk around. We visit into the art gallery at the Soper House building, uh, where there's lots of uh, works of art and carvings that the passengers or travelers can uh, check out. And of course, we try to play a, a game uh, in the community in 2017, we played soccer. Uh, of course, the locals uh, completely destroyed the Adventure Canada, the passengers and staff. <laughs> uh, I don't think it was any contest, but it was a lot of fun regardless. Um, and we did see some cultural demonstrations as well in, in the community hall. So you can see some Arctic games performed and some dancing. Uh, and of course, we can try some local food as well. Uh, from Kimarut, we head a, uh, a little bit further to the east into Kingate. And here's Jason to properly pronounce it. <laughs> Pretty close. Kingate. And Kingate quite simply translates to mountains. Um, and if you're coming from the west, this is where you'll start to see mountain ranges start to form. Um, so again, it, uh, it, it puts the place into perspective. Kingite means mountains. Perfect. Uh, this community is about four times the size of the previous community. So it is two community visits, uh, two days in a row. Um, very different feel here in also known as Cape Dorset, Kingate, um, about four times the size of Kimarut. Uh, really, this is where Inuit art flourished, this ground zero for Inuit art, uh, the Inuit art market. Um, and this is the location of the oldest professional Inuit printmaking in Canada. Um, so this is a, a really popular spot. Um, we have our um, one of our resource staff and who is also pictured in that early shot that I, I showed of the history of Adventure Canada. Uh, he's pictured there beside uh, Matthew Swan and David Suzuki, and that's um, John Houston. So John Houston is almost always on our Heart of the Arctic expedition and often on uh, one of the Northwest Passage expeditions. Um, and his father, James Houston, uh, brought Japanese printmaking over to the Canadian Arctic. Um, and John Houston was uh, born in Cape Dorset in Kingate. And um, he will be able to uh, show you how to make your own Inuit fish print on board the vessel. He will be in the community explaining a little bit more about uh, Inuit art. Uh, he's a fantastic storyteller uh, and a really great uh, person to sit down with for breakfast, lunch, or dinner and, and to talk to. So moving on from 
uh, community visits, we will have um, some uh, stops into the Ungava Peninsula. And Jason, are you going to chime in? Oh, yeah. Ungava. Uh, I, I'm going to comment as well. John Houston, he's been with Adventure Canada a very long time. Uh, amazing. He's fluent in Inuktitut. Again, born and uh, raised in Klingait. Uh, so, so, but Ungava, uh, for those that don't know, the uh, Ungava Peninsula pretty much separates or, or is located in to the western side of Ungava Bay, uh, which separates kind of Labrador and Quebec. Um, and Ungava means heading towards open water. So it, again, it makes sense. You're just about to head out to sea once you pass it. Yeah, perfect. So these are our Arctic tundra days on the Ungava Peninsula. Uh, so we're here in July. The tundra will be in full bloom. So it's uh, a great chance to see um, botany and, of course, ornithology as well. Um, fantastic for those geologists. We have incredible uh, rock formations. And um, of course, you can get your, uh, photo uh, your camera out and take all the photographs of these beautiful landscapes, uh, which include Diggs Island and Cape Diggs as we head from um, the Ungava Peninsula in towards uh, Ungava Bay. And on Diggs, uh, Cape Diggs, we have uh, common murs and thick-billed murs uh, nesting on the cliffs here. Uh, so there's, there's lots of different wildlife that we'll have the opportunity to view, whether it's polar bears, uh, Arctic fox, Arctic hare, um, lots of different whale species here. It's a very nutrient rich area as the water is coming from Hudson's Bay into the North Atlantic and vice versa. Um, so a really fantastic spot for wildlife. Uh, I saw wildland uh, caribou here uh, in 2017 when I was on board. And in Ngava Bay, we have Akpatak Island. Um, and Jason's going to chime in to tell you all about what Akpatak means. Yeah, so Akpatak, like we are. Uh... Akpatuk Island. Akpak is the uh, the word we use for mer, uh, and I don't know if you guys know what mers are, but they're small penguin-like birds uh, that aren't very good at flying and taste delicious. Akpatuk just means this is where the mers are, or the place of mers. And there's lots of those mers on Akpatak Island. It's about 900 square kilometers. And uh, we do a great Zodiac cruise here, uh, as well as a ship's cruise along the island. Uh, and if you're just a little uh, confused as to where exactly we are, so south of Baffin Island in Ungava Bay here, just to the west of the Torngat Mountains of Labrador. Again, those thick build mers are all along the cliffs of Aquatoc Island. You can see some of them pictured here. Uh, as Jason mentioned, very tasty and the polar bears know that. And so uh, often the polar bears are there to have a little extra snack. So uh, coming back to the map, you can see the beginning of the Heart of the, Ex uh, Heart of the Arctic Expedition and, and the first uh, week or so that we've done on Southern Baffin Island in Hudson Strait and in Gova Bay. And then we have a day at sea crossing over the Davis Strait. And Jason is going to fill you in on what it's like on a day at sea as we cross over. Yeah, and again, um, it really comes down to our to our expedition team. Uh, some people think that a day at sea uh, might kind of sound a sound a kind sound kind of boring, um, but uh, in this case, uh, we've had some really busy days. Um, and you think that you'll get some downtime, but that's not how we really operate. So our expedition team comes into full swing on our sea days. We, uh, we get in all of our expedition team up and presenting in workshops, presentations, a full schedule of events throughout the day. And we try to get you engaged and kind of moving your body, your hands. We do throat singing uh, workshops, language workshops. Uh, arts and crafts. Uh, we'll have our geology table out and pretty much anything that you're, you can pick and choose and rotate through uh, all of these programs that we have uh, going on. Uh, how rough does it usually get? Um, I, it's not like the Drake Passage, I can tell you that, but there are some days that the ship is moving. The ship, fortunately, is extremely stable. It's equipped with stabilizers which uh, does side to side movement. And it has to be pretty rough in order for you to not really uh, enjoy it. 
but it's all part of the experience as well. Oh. And Nuuk, uh, we're into Greenland now. The Greenlandic dialect, and this might be interesting to you all, is that uh, the Kalalit, or the Greenlanders, are also Inuit, uh, we're circ circumpolar people. Um, so the language is, is extremely different. Sorry, it's the same language, but it's the dialect is so different that you almost wouldn't be able to understand it. I compare it to a Texan speaking to a Bayman Newfoundlander. There would be no comprehension of what the, each other are saying, even though they're speaking the same language. Um, but Nuuk basically translates to Cape. And uh, that city, as you would see from a map, is located on a cape. Perfect. And then Nuuk is the capital of Greenland, uh, about 17,000 or a little bit more than 17,000 people living here. Uh, this is about a third, one third of Greenland's population. Um, there's the National Museum here, uh, which houses the uh, Greenlandic mummies. So there's eight mummies that were discovered in Umanak Fjord, and they are in the National Museum there. There's also the University of Greenland. Um, and if that's not your thing, um, you know, there are there is great shopping here um, and you can uh, check out the, the Kiviet store, um, which has Kiviet, which is um, muskox wool. And muskox wool is, uh, it's the softest, warmest, and of course, the most expensive wool in the world. Uh, it's traditionally used to, clay, uh, to clothe babies, and that uh, is because it's so soft and so warm. Uh, really uh, quite an interesting place to walk around. Feels, it has a very European feel. And uh, from here, uh, we will then head into the Fjord of Eternity. And this is also known as Evidsgid Fjorden. And Jason's going to fill you in and on some of the names here. Yeah, so it, it, it gets interesting once we're in Greenland as well, because English would be third language, Danish would be next. Evidsgid Fjorden translates in Danish to Fjord of Eternity. And this is one of the few cases where it almost matches up with the with the Nuktitut name, which is Kongaluswatsjak, which means a great long fjord. <laughs> That's great <laughs> and long. <laughs> uh, we will head all the way along, uh, or at least portion a portion of this great long fjord, uh, and we will head uh, towards an ice fall. So this is a glacier that is uh, hanging precipitously off of a cliff right down to the water. Uh, and we will do a zodiac cruise here. Uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful way to end the expedition uh, as we're coming into the last couple of days here. Um, we will have a, a zodiac cruise along the, uh, the front of this glacier. Uh, we've often seen uh, a variety of different wildlife here, especially seals. Um, but we also will have a barbecue lunch out in front of this glacier. So you do your Zodiac cruise, you come back to the Ocean Endeavor and you're sitting on the back deck facing an incredible vista, uh, taking in the views while you're having your barbecue lunch. It's, it's a really fantastic day in the, the Fjord of Eternity. And so from here, uh, we head from uh, the Fjord of Eternity up to a really long fjord, Kangalusuak. Well done, well done. Kongalusuatsiak versus Kongalusuak, the difference is you remove the grate. So rather than a great long fjord, it's a long fjord. <laughs> Perfect. And this is where we um, will fly. We will uh, head off the ship, uh, Zodiac transfer to the shore. We have a bus up to the, uh, the airport in Kongalusuak, and we then fly to Toronto. So that uh, quite long fjord, uh, as you can see here on the map, and that'd be on day 13 of our expedition. As I mentioned, we didn't cover every single day on the expedition. Um, and this may change as the sea ice conditions and the different wildlife viewings occur. We may uh, be changing the itinerary on the fly and that's all part of the adventure. So this is Southern Baffin Island. And uh, we mentioned that we were gonna talk about our high Arctic explorer expedition as well. So you can see the Arctic circle there shown on the map and Southern Baffin Island with the blue line for Heart of the Arctic, and then the green line for our High Arctic Explorer expedition. And you'll notice there's just one date shown on this map, but in fact, when we actually pull up to the next map, there are two dates 
for this expedition in 2022. So August 2nd to 13th and 13th to 24th. So they do run back to back, the first trip going from Kangaroo Swack to uh, Resolute, uh, Kai Suiktuk. Uh, and this then is going to be the return journey on the 13th to the 24th heading back towards Greenland. So two different expeditions running in the opposite directions. So I'm just going to cover the uh, the first expedition, the second, the thirteenth. Uh, but just imagine that the um, second expedition will be done in reverse, and will be slightly different, as just things always occur a little different on each of the expeditions. So uh, we have an early morning flight from Toronto to Kangaroosuak. Uh, we're going to have about a five and a half to six hour flight. So early morning, probably about six or seven in the morning, we're leaving. Uh, we've had the briefing the night before in the Sheraton in Toronto, and we're then uh, landing uh, in Kangaroo Swack, a bus transfer out to the Ocean Endeavour, Zodiac to the ship, and then our safety briefing on board. It's a big day, um, but then we will be in Western Greenland exploring, uh, heading along the coastline, the Sismute coast here, and likely our first stop will be into the community of Sismute. And Sisimute is a is a fun one. Uh, Sisimute translates uh, Sisik is basically a foxhole. Sisimute means there's lots of foxholes in this place. I doubt that there are any more because it's fairly large. But again, you gather why they would have named it that place in the Sisimute place of lots of foxholes. Um, yeah, it is. It is a larger city. Uh, it's the second largest city after Nuke in Greenland, about 5,500 people. Um, a great place to walk around. Um, and we have the opportunity to stop into uh, the art workshop here. Um, a fantastic place myself. I, I have bought um, a few different pieces here. Uh, it's, it's quite wonderful to see the artists producing their art live uh, in the shop. Um, and it's a great place to walk around, uh, quite a lively community. Uh, and this will be our first day, first, first real stop, should be, I should say second day uh, on this expedition for the high Arctic Explorer. Um, before we're then into Alulasat. So this is approximately day three and uh, Jason's gonna let you know how I didn't say the name correctly. <laughs> Alulasat was actually pretty good. Um... And you know what, this place is going to, again, it falls in line to one of the reasons we go here. Elulisat translates to iceberg. Perfect. Yeah, Elulisat is one of my favorite places. Uh, this is uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, you can walk through the community and these uh, passengers you see here on the boardwalk have walked through the community uh, up to the UNESCO site and are walking down towards the water here uh, to see some of the massive glaciers, or sorry, massive icebergs that have calved off a glacier that's about 40 kilometers up the fjord. This is one of the fastest moving glaciers, the Jakobs, Jakobshavn Glacier. It's one of the fastest moving glaciers in the world uh, outside of uh, Antarctica. The ice is over 250,000 years old. Um, and it is moving at a rate that kind of boggles the mind, 20 to 35 meters per day, 20 billion tons of icebergs every year. An unbelievable amount. And we will be there for a hike into the community and up to the UNESCO site. Uh, and then we do a Zodiac cruise for the second half of the day. And that could be the uh, flip of this. So we made Zodiac cruise first before we walk, um, but uh, absolutely stunning to be right close to these icebergs as they're coming out of this long fjord here. And uh, the uh, whales here, the humpback whales know that the waters are very nutrient rich. And so it's very common to see humpback whales feeding here right next to the icebergs. It's a really, really uh, incredible sight to behold. So that's a Lulasat, one of my favorite places to visit. And um, yeah, hopefully you can join us to come on board for a trip to a Lulasat. So um, we do have uh, the opportunity from Alulisat to head up into uh, Disco Bay, and then we have our day at sea. Uh, so we have lots of fun events on board. Uh, we do have trivia games and theme nights in addition to uh, the presentations uh, that will be uh, and workshops that will be occurring on board the ship. And then we're going to be uh, crossing over 
the uh, over Baffin Bay. So we're a little further north than da the Davis Strait. We're actually crossing over Baffin Bay into Canada. And we're going into Lancaster Sound, or as Jason will let you know. Yes, yeah, so uh, this is really exciting, actually. And, and we just kind of highlighted the region in the map. But uh, the Canadian government has just established a new marine protected area in this uh, region of the Arctic. And the it, it is called Talukutup Imanga. Uh, Talukutup Imanga. Uh, it, it's a it's a really interesting translation. It kind of it, it translates to the waters around Devon Island. Now, Talukutup uh, is is Devon Island, and that means um, an island that as resembles a woman's tattoos on her uh, on her chin, and they're always kind of triangular. So the very high mountain peaks on Devon Island. So Talukutup Imanga means the water surrounding the island that looks like a woman's tattoos. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, so we're heading into the marine reserve here in Tarotiap Amanga. And our first stop into Canada will be into uh, a place called Pond Inlet or Mitamatalik. That was also pretty good. And also one of my favorite uh, Inuktitut place names because I don't quite know the answer to it. It, it means the place where Mitima lives. But I've never met anyone who knows who Mitima is. But wherever, the, like, however long ago when the place got its name, a guy named Mitima lived there. Hopefully we'll, we'll figure that out one day. Um, yeah, we have a community visit into Pond Inlet. Um, this is a, a community that's directly across um, from Violet Island. Uh, which is uh, separated by Eclipse Sound. And you can see in the picture here, the community in the foreground and Eclipse Sound in the midground. Uh, and in the background, we have Violet Island the, and the Marine Reserve there. Absolutely stunning vistas uh, from Pond Inlet. Uh, really, really a great place. Always a warm welcome. Uh, this is, this is a, a great place to um, walk around and, and meet the people who live here in Mitamatalik. We will uh, continue on north from uh, Pond Inlet. We head up through Navy Board Inlet and we cross over um, Lancaster Sound or Talaraptia Amanga, and we get over to Devon Island. And on Devon Island, there is uh, a place called Dundas Harbor. And this was an old RCMP outpost. Um, and this, is, um, this was opened in about 19, the 1920s. It became a Hudson's Bay Company outpost. Um, before then closing in 1951 uh, due to the difficult sea ice conditions in the area. It is uh, home to one of the most northerly cemeteries in the world. And you can see the, the uh, RCMP outpost in the background there. Um, you'll have to come on board to, to learn the story of, of, of this place. It's, it's quite interesting, even though it was only open for about 30 years. About uh, 50 kilometers to the west, we have uh, Croker Bay, and Croker Bay will be uh, the second part of this day. Um, so we go to Dundas Harbor and then along to Croker Bay, uh, and we do a Zodiac cruise here in Croker Bay. Um, great place to see quite a different um, a glacier front. This is um, not nearly as, as massive as what we see in Alulasat in Greenland. Uh, this uh, tidewater glacier is is um, still moving relatively quickly, but it's um, it's certainly not as massive and, and, and producing as much ice as the Jakobshavn glacier in uh, Greenland. Uh, but it does still cover about 12,000 square kilometers as the ice cap of Devon Island. Um, and this um, is a great place to head out on our kayaks. So we do have a kayak program on board. There are only 12 spots, but it's a great place to, uh, to take a kayak out and kayak along the front of the glacier there. Um, in Croker Bay, we have a lot of opportunities to see wildlife, whether it's walrus, uh, seals, uh, Arctic fox along the shoreline. And um, this shot from our, our trip in 2018, where we had a mom and two one and a half year old cubs on an iceberg in the uh, fjord there in Croker Bay. I guess it's in the bay there. <laughs> uh, heading a little further west, we head to another UNESCO World Heritage Site. 
we go to Beachy Island. Uh, this is a UNESCO site because this was the uh, site of uh, three of the graves of Franklin's men. Uh, the 1845 expedition, that British explorer who uh, was destined to cross the Northwest Passage and uh, did not make it. Uh, they were really never heard from after they left Greenland in 1845. Uh, but this was the first site that they had in the um, really uh, any knowledge of, of where Franklin's men might have ended up. Of course, the ships were found further south uh, in the 2000s, about, uh, about five years ago now. Um, and we visit this UNESCO site. Uh, you can see the three graves of Franklin's men as well as the fourth grave from uh, a, a sailor who perished on a subsequent rescue mission for the Franklin expedition. You can see some of the tin cans of um, the, the food was stored in. This was the early technology of the time of um, being able to, to put food into tin cans. Um, so this UNESCO site is quite uh, quite high on the list for most travelers who wanted to get up into the Canadian Arctic to see that um, that passage through the Northwest Passage, the fabled passage uh, that never was, that never actually was completed. So we do head a little bit further to the west to finish the expedition, and we go to Resolute, uh, which is also known as Kaiswitak. Yes, and, and this one is again a, a very interesting one, and it's a little, the place name itself is a story of reconciliation. Um, Kaiswitak is is not a traditional community. It was uh, kind of put there by the Canadian government in the name of, um, what's the word? Sovereignty, Arctic sovereignty. So what they did is they, they relocated Inuit from Nunavik, so in Northern Quebec, which is uh, below the Arctic Circle on the tree line totally different wildlife, totally different landscape, and and moved them there to Hauswittuk with the promise that they could go home if they didn't like it. Um, and left them there. And of course, none of the Inuit have scientific backgrounds to realize that now they're above the Arctic Circle. They're well above the Arctic Circle. They're dropped off in the fall. Uh, and Hauswittuk means the place where the sun never rises. I, having been there myself, it is, um, it's, I can't imagine being there uh, dropped off. Um, and it's, it's certainly something that, um, you know, we, we do discuss on board the ship uh, in terms of uh, the forced relocations. And it is kind of fitting that we are also then here showing a picture of the capital of Canada and, and where those decisions were made. And this is all stuff that we will talk about on board of the expedition. And that does uh, conclude where we will be traveling on the High Arctic Explorer. Um, so finishing that 12-day expedition, so the uh, High Arctic Explorer 12-day expeditions, the two of them uh, back to back in 2022 and uh, bringing up both of the two expeditions, the Heart of the Arctic, the 13-day trip, as well as the High Arctic Explorer. Uh, if you were interested to do both of these expeditions back to back or any of the two expeditions in 2022, uh, we do have an extra promotion on for uh, multi-trips. So two trips in a season, would uh, uh, we would honor a 10% promotion on both expeditions. Um, with, you know, the current COVID environment, we do have a flexible booking policy. Um, so we have flexible cancellation terms and transfers as well, uh, available for all expeditions that we operate in order to really enhance your, your security and your feeling of, um, uh, of well-being and, and security for sure. We have uh, something I didn't mention before, we do also have free single supplements. So many travelers who uh, travel solo uh, do not pay extra to be on board in their own uh, in their own cabin. And you can also see the passenger here with one of the Adventure Canada Expedition jackets. Uh, this is included in the cost of the trip and yours to take home after the trip. And working with Merit Travel, uh, we are offering for everybody who attended today a, an exclusive special. And so this is a limited time offer we're doing for the next two weeks. This will be combinable with the multi-trip as well. Um, so we are offering 15% 
on the 2022 expeditions on board. Uh, really, the, the heart of the Arctic and high Arctic would be a fantastic combination if you were interest, interested to join for those trips. Uh, but really, if you can book onto any of the expeditions, I highly recommend taking advantage of this 15% uh, percent savings. And we are also going to be offering, and Darren, did you want to talk about the, the credit that we're offering? Yes. <clears throat> so we do, uh, of course, with our travel talks, we do like to always have uh, some sort of prize and some sort of giveaway. So for everybody on the call, we're going to send a test for all the Nukatuk names for everybody on the call. But you can send us a video with you giving your best voice. I'm totally kidding. Um, although that would be kind of fun to have everybody have everybody give a try at that. But uh, we do have a $500 um, travel credit towards um, an expedition with um, Adventure Canada. So everybody that signed up for the today's session will be entered into the draw and we will be sending out an email um, to the winner of the, of the talk. Um, we are a little bit over on time. We really appreciate everybody sticking it out. Um, in the question box, we've done a really good job at answering most of your questions. And as I said, we're a little bit over time, but we do have something a little bit special for everyone to really bring this talk um, full circle. And going back to my love of the Arctic and its music, um, we're going to have Jason is going to sing us a, a song. Yes, and uh, so you've heard me say the place names and people often ask like they want to hear it strung into a sentence. Um, so I'll sing you a song. Uh, it's in Inuktitut, so you won't understand it. But it's a, it's a home of my, it's a song about my home region of Labrador in Nunatsiavut. Um, and it's we've adopted it as our anthem for the Nunatsiavut region, and it kind of translates to uh, people of Labrador. And, and the song is really about like why you would love to live in a place like this. <laughs> That was amazing. Thank you, Jason.
And for those who do decide to sail with us, Jason's not only an expedition leader, but if you're lucky, he will actually sing on board uh, for you as well. So I had the honor of um, having Jason sing on our expedition. So now if you go on, you see him on board, you got to tell him, remember that time I was on the Merit Travel, Travel Talk and you sang? Darren said that you'd sing on board, so. Um, there have been a couple questions, so for if people want to stick around, but I have, somebody asked, how cold does it get? Can somebody answer that one? Definitely not cold enough to need the uh, parka that I had in the earlier slides, uh, because you're traveling, quote unquote, more or less in the, in the summer. Um, the coldest it's going to get, you might need a couple layers, but definitely not anything where you would need uh, a full parka and winter gloves and everything like that. It can get a little bit chilly the further north you get, but nothing, uh, nothing extreme. As us Canadians on the call, it's uh, probably like a February day in Vancouver, right, Martin? <laughs> yeah, it does. It does change, but certainly on these two trips, um, we are at the heart uh, height of the summer, and so um, you're probably going to have a, an average temperature of about 12 to 15 degrees Celsius. Um, it can obviously be cooler than this, and it, I've had up into the low 20s in southern Greenland. Um, so it does. It does definitely change. The, the key is to have layers on. Uh, making sure you have a nice base layer and you know, maybe a fleece as well as your jacket. And because we're always on the zodiacs when we're going from the ship onto the land, you know, you want to be prepared for those little splashes that might occur on the zodiac. So it's always important to be prepared. I think we've really taken up everybody's time and we've answered all the questions that came in in the chat as they were coming in. I just wanted to remind everybody who is left on the call that if you signed up, with an email that you don't check very often and you wanted a brochure, just make sure that you are checking your emails because we do send it out. It comes from an advisor, a follow-up email that will reach you between five and seven business days after this. So look forward to talking to you all in the future. And thank you, Jason and Martin and Darren for a, a really great presentation today. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you everybody. Thanks guys. Take care. Have a great day. Okay. Stay safe.